I'm Professor John Schwant, and this is my second video in a series on accenting Biblical and Ancient Greek. If you haven't seen the first video on general accenting principles, please go and watch that. It's a short video, only 10 minutes, and that will prepare you for this one. At the end of this video, you will be able to accent any non-verb with a proper accent in the proper place. I hope you enjoy it. So as a quick review, I assume that you already know the three kinds of accents, the acute, the grave, and the circumflex are three syllables that we can accent, the antepenult, the penult, and the ultima, and the various lengths of vowels. Now I want to quickly review the antepenult, penult, and ultima, especially the ultima that governs the possible accenting. We're going to start by assuming that it's short, and I have a small island represented here. Now when it's short, the acute is the most flexible. It can be placed over any of these syllables. And the circumflex is one step behind on the penult, now let's see what happens when we lengthen the ultima. It basically, it slows everybody down. The acute may only be placed over the last two syllables in this situation, and the circumflex only over the last. And these are the only two possibilities, the only two situations for accenting. Words with a long ultima or words or scenarios with a short ultima. I explain all of these issues more thoroughly in my first video on general accenting principles. But now we are finally ready to turn our attention to accenting real words. And we're going to start with nonverbs. And the general principle for accenting nonverbs is retention. We're going to have words that are born with accents on their ultima, and they're going to want to stay there. They, the principle is retention. They want to retain their original placement. So we're going to have some words with an ultima preference, some words with a penult preference, and some words with an antepenult preference. So this is going to simplify all of those possibilities that we've covered up to this point. Words born with an acute on the ultima are called oxytone. Uh, you can think of the name of the hair being oxy, oxytone. In the first and second declensions, these types of words will have acutes or grobs if they're followed by another word on the nominative and accusative cases. Notice they're almost all short except for the accusative plural, oftus. And then for the genitive and dative forms, oftu, ofto, ofton, and oftus, they'll have circumflexes. I call this the box pattern. So the primary cases, the upper box, will have acutes, and the lower box will have circumflexes. That's going to be standard for the first and second declension. Words like adverbs that are born with circumflexes on their ultima will, won't ever change. They'll just keep that circumflex right there. Let's take a look at our example sentence here and see how many words apply to this ultima preference. First, I got by two. Notice it is accented on its ultima. It's a non-verb. It's actually a noun. And so it would follow this box pattern, the nominative and accusatives, and in this case, the vocative, all have acutes. If it changes to a genitive or dative case and the ending becomes long, it would have a circumflex. If we scan across, we don't see another word accented on its ultima until we get to ofto. Notice it has a circumflex. It uh, applies here. It is a dative. Uh, it has a long ending. If it were nominative, it would have an acute. So it's following our box pattern perfectly. Keep scanning along, and the next word that we see with an accent on its ultima is kathos. It's an adverb, and it, uh, it's not in the first or second declension, so it's always going to have an acute or a grave in this case because it's followed by another word. Remember from the last video, any time that acute is on the last syllable of a word and it's followed by another word, then it changes to grave. And then uh, we have ke. Again, it's not a first or second declension word, so it's not following the box pattern. It's just keeping an acute, or in this case, grave, because it's followed by another word. Then oftos is a first and second declension word. It's second declension, and it has an acute, but in this case, it's changed to a grave because it's followed by another word. Notice the last word in the sentence, peripatin. It has a circumflex over its ultima. That is actually due to a contraction, and we'll cover that in our video on verbs. Now let's keep that ultima long and look at words accented with an acute on their penult. They will never change. It will just keep its accent in that same position all the time. So those are pretty easy. In our example sentence, we have three words accented with an acute on their penult, legon, menin, and ophili. Now because ophili is an indicative verb, uh, we're not going to 
deal with that now since verbs have a different principle, that of recession, and we're dealing with non-verbs. So we can talk about legon and minin, even though people may think of those as verbs. Uh, legon is a participle and minin is an infinitive. So those are non-indicative forms of a verb root. So those would apply here. We can see that in both cases, the ultima is long and the acute can sit there. But even if it were short, and again, here I'll kind of bring in a verb uh, example. If we made it a command, lege or mene, it would still be an acute on the penult. Because acute on the penult has some flexibility, it can handle either a long ultima or a short ultima. So there's no reason for it to change. So it's very stable. We're almost done. We've covered two out of the three possible ways of accenting nonverbs. We had words accented on their ultima, which either followed the box pattern or just stayed on the ultima. We had words accented on their penult with an acute that were completely stable and they didn't change. So now we're to words that have their accent stretched to their father's position. And this is the last logical possibility for accenting nonverbs. Now, in order to get our accents out to their furthest possible position, we have to assume that we have a short ultima. Once the ultima is short, the acute can run all the way out to the antepenult, panting and sweating out there. And the circumflex is close, but one step behind on the penult. Now, when acute was on the ultima, we called it oxytone. When acute was on the penult, that was paroxytone. And now way out here on the antepenult, we call that pro-paroxytone. And let's look at anthropos from our sentence here. And I have the full declension of anthropos for you. You can see that in the nominative and accusative singular, it has that short ending, it's fine. But then in the genitive and dative singular, the ending turns long and it can't stay out there on the antepenult. So it moves back and becomes just paroxytone or acute on the penult. And the same thing happens in the plural, basically. In the nominative plural, you are ending. That is short, even though it's a digraph. It's one of our exceptional digraphs, one of the final letters. And so it can stay out there on the antepenult. But in all the other endings, us, on, and us, for the dative plural, those syllables are long, and so it has to, again, move back to the penult, and it becomes just paroxytone. And this is going to be our solution to any of these words that are stretched to their limit as far as the accenting goes. If they're stretched with a short ultima, and then suddenly the ultima becomes long, they have to revert to a paroxytone word, a word accented with an acute on its penult. The exact same thing happens with a kinos. It has a circumflex on its penult that is stretched to its furthest position, and it's fine in the nominative and accusative singular. But as soon as we get to the genitive and dative singular with a long ending, as soon as that ending turns long, to correct that, we want to keep it in the same position so we can. Uh, we just turn it into a paroxytone word, an acute on the penult. So a kinu, a kino. Uh, the plural forms, we can have the circumflex in the nominative plural, but again, with those long endings for the accusative, genitive, and dative plural, it has to change paroxytone to the acute on the penult. All right, let's review all three options for accenting now. We have words accented with an acute on the ultima. We call that oxytone. And if it's a first and second declension noun with that acute, it follows the box pattern. If not, or if it has a circumflex on its ultima, we call that circumflex on the ultima, that kind of word, a perispomenon. Uh, then there's no change to the word. We saw that in our sentence in kathos. Words accented with an acute on their penult are called paroxytones, and there is no reason ever to change that accent, since acute can be in that position either with a long ultima or a short ultima, so they're safe. And then the last option requires that we have a short ultima. And at that point, the accents can move to their farthest position and they're stretched to their furthest position there. They become very vulnerable to a change. And we change their name in that furthest stretched position. We put a pro on, on their name. So the acute type words are called pro-paroxytone and the circumflex type words are called pro-perispomenon, where we have the circumflex on the penult. Now, all it takes is that ultima to become long, and those accents are not eligible to be in their furthest positions. So we have one fix for both of these situations. We simply put that acute on the penult in its very stable position. 
We just make them paroxytone words and we remedy the whole situation. So that covers every logical possibility for accenting non-verbs. And even verbs will basically follow this further stretch position type of pattern. But uh, I'll get more into that in the next video. So to review one more time, we can either accent on the ultima, which would follow the box pattern or just stay there. We could have acute on the penult, which is called paroxytone, which has no change no matter what happens to the ultima. Or we could have the accent stretch to their furthest position. And when the ending becomes long and the ultima becomes long, we just change it back to that second position to the paroxytone. And that's it for accenting non-verbs. I hope this video was helpful to you. And I hope that you will continue on and watch the next video on how to accent verbs, the recessive accent for verbs. And then you will have basic accenting down for biblical and ancient Greek. Please check us out at facebook.com slash IBG page for tools and links to other videos. And please drop by our website at www.biblicalgreek.org. Thanks for watching.